Hello. Today we're going to talk about observer control. And actually I think that observers or the name observer is actually a misnomer. I would prefer to use the term estimator because what we are trying to do is estimate the, uh, the states that you're trying to control. And the reason why you want to estimate the states is because you can't measure them directly or you can't measure them accurately. And we will have an example of why this is such a problem. So to start with, let's talk about the system we're going to try to control. Uh, first, we're going to have a controller. We have a, uh, a PID with a second derivative gain. And uh, uh, this is necessary to control a open loop system like this. This is um, actually a linearized model of a hydraulic actuator. And you can see there are, um, this is a third order um, equation in the denominator. Plus we add one pole from the integrator and we'll have a four pole system. And that will make it so that we need to have four gains. And because we're going to have a derivative and a second derivative gain, um, it's going to be very difficult to uh, calculate uh, velocities and accelerations um, accurately just using the position feedback. I'm not going to go into too much detail here. Um, I'm going to cover this more in uh, the calculating the gains in a, another video. So I'm going to go down. This is the symbolic gains for the integrated proportional gain, derivative, and second derivative gain. Now we're going to get to the uh, observer itself. And what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the observer gains symbolically. And the reason why I want to do that is because the textbooks make, um, make it very obscure. They, there's an awful lot of magical matrix math and uh, they don't really give you a good feeling as to what's going on once you start uh, working through the um, matrix manipulations. But I want to start with what's in the books. So in the books we have, uh, this is our change of state and this is our estimated change of state. We have uh, the A matrix which is our transition matrix um, and that's going to be multiplied by the um, error between the uh, actual state and the estimated state. And then we have a correcting uh, feature here where we have the measured uh, position because we're going to be talking about a hydraulic actuator. We're trying to control position in this example. And we have the estimated position. And uh, with some substitutions here, you get uh, this is the error between the x hat or x prime and x hat prime. And uh, this is one of the things that just really confused me for so long is that this they aren't really using the transition matrix as it would be used in a simulation. This term is normally down here and this term is usually here when you're using a formula like this. But to calculate the observer gains, they got to play these tricks where they swap the uh, some of the terms around. So you really can't say that this A matrix here this is the same as this A matrix here. And like I said, that confused me for a long time. And hopefully um, it won't confuse you, but to make the uh, calculations for the observer gains work out, they had to swap these two terms from here to here and here to here. And if you do the matrix math, you get uh, an equation that looks like this. And if you look at this, it is really just the sum of two polynomials. So uh, one of the polynomials is the denominator of the open loop system. This is the same as the denominator of the open loop system from above. The second is just a simple uh, polynomial with the Leuenberger uh, gains. We have the uh, L2, L1 with S, and then L0 with S squared. So um, it would be easy to add more terms or subtract more terms uh, if you just remember that all you're doing is you're adding two polynomials together. And what we're going to do is we're going to adjust these, calculate what gains for the uh, observer, make it so that the errors will decrease between the estimated and the actual. So let's choose a, uh, a way that we want, you know, the filtering 
to make the errors uh, decrease to zero. And I've got two choices here. I can use um, a three-pole low-pass filter, see how the errors decay that way, or a three-pole Butterworth filter. I'm going to use a three-pole uh, Butterworth filter in this example. Um, so what we need to do is equate the uh, powers of S between the uh, open loop uh, denominator and the uh, uh, desired uh, three-pole Butterworth filter. Uh, and uh, so we have this S is equal to L2. Remember up here we have L2, so this has got to be equated to this. This term is equated to this one, and this term is equated to this one. This is so simple, you can almost work it out uh, without having to use any kind of math whatsoever. And that's why I think it is so much better to use this method over the matrix method because the matrix method is um, uh, much too complicated and it kind of obscures what's really going on. So you can see that uh, we have uh, decreasing powers of lambda. Now the lambda is the uh, pole position, it's actually at minus lambda here. Uh, the poles are actually at, at minus lambda. So now we're going to try to apply this to a real system because this is where you can see how the uh, uh, estimator or observer works or will shine. So I'm going to uh, start out by having a gain natural frequency and damping factor for my hydraulic actuator. And I'm going to call these estimated loop parameters. And the reason why I'm using estimated is because you don't really know where the, what the, the true transfer function is. It's certainly not going to be linear, but we can estimate using uh, system identification methods. And like I've said in other videos, that's key to success in doing closed loop control. Um, due to the nature of this system, uh, we have to have lambda. Now this is the uh, closed loop pole location for the uh, the controller now in, in this case. And we're going to make that at minus whatever I calculated the natural frequency to be. So I've got four poles at uh, minus lambda. And given that, uh, from the equations above, symbolic equations, I can calculate an integrator gain, proportional gain, derivative gain, and second derivative gain. I can also calculate feed forwards. Now, in the textbooks, everything works out nicely, but that's no real life. And what I want to do is show how this, the observers will shine in an actual application. I am estimating that uh, this is 10, but you can see that the real system, the actual system, is going to have a gain of 11 millimeters per second per percent. My estimated uh, damping factor is 0.333, and in this case, I've uh, got 0.35. My estimated natural frequency is 62.8, or you know, 2 pi times pi times 10. And uh, you can see that my actual uh, system is 58.33. So my model and the actual are close, but not exact. Now what I want to do is calculate observer gains. Now I'm going to switch lambda now is going to be equal is going to be the observer poles. And what we're going to want to do is make the observer poles about 10 times faster than the, um, the closed loop poles. So what I did is I multiplied lambda by 10. So this is the uh, closed loop poles for the controller, but now I'm calculating an observer pole. So I'm kind of using lambda for two different purposes here. From the equation above, I calculate the lure burger gains to be uh, this. Now I'm going to generate a uh, target. I'm going to do a motion profile where I'm going to go 500 millimeters uh, in one second. So my maximum velocity should be about 750 millimeters per second and my maximum acceleration should be about 375 uh, millimeters per second squared or about 3.3 meters per second squared. Now to make things difficult and realistic again I am going to also add uh, feedback resolution. And I'm going to assume that the feedback resolution is 10 microns, or 0 0.01 millimeters. And if I divide that by my sample time, you can see that my 
uh, best velocity resolution is going to be 10 millimeters per second, uh, and then my acceleration is going to be, so I've divided this by 1,000, so this is actually 10 meters per second squared. I'm adding noise uh, just to make things more difficult, more realistic. And uh, one of the things I want to show you is that uh, given that the resolution is uh, quite coarse, if I multiply the integrator and the proportional and the derivative and the second derivative gain by just one count of resolution, which is going to be the 0 0.01, you can see that the output is going to change 58%, and that would not be usable. So we can't really use the, uh, uh, the derivative gain and the second derivative gain by uh, using drift difference methods. We have to use uh, a filtered method like the observer. So I'm going to do a simulation. I'm going to use Runge and Kutta, um, and differential equations. And the reason why I want to do that is because, again, when you start using matrices, the um, numbers and the meaning of what's going on gets lost uh, once you start doing the, the array manipulation. So to start with, I'm going to have uh, two sets of numbers. I have my actual uh, values here, actual uh, position, velocity, and acceleration. Then I have my estimated uh, position, velocity, and acceleration, and my initial uh, PID or controller output. So uh, in my differential equation, I got time and the state variable y. So what I'm doing is I'm taking this y and I, I'm setting it to these individual values so I don't have to use subscripts for the y, it makes it difficult to understand. I have a target generator that generates a uh, position, target position, target velocity, target acceleration, and target jerk at uh, time t for whatever move time and move distance I uh, desire, which in, in this case this is one second, and this is 500 millimeters. I'm going to start out by using the uh, feed forward values from above. I got a velocity feed forward times the target velocity, the uh, uh, acceleration feed forward times the target acceleration, and the uh, jerk feed forward uh, multiplied by the, the target jerk. I limit it to 100%. Oh, I first I add it to the uh, control output from the time before, and I have a new control output. Um, and you have to remember that th these feed forwards are calculated using the estimated values, so they aren't perfect. They're off by a little bit. But you'll see that it doesn't make much difference. So now I need to do two calculations. I need to calculate two jerks. One is going to be the actual jerk using the, what, the actual uh, parameters which is uh, uh, the numbers from the, um, after the random number generators. And then I have my estimated values. Right. You can see that both equations are identical except for I'm using estimated values here and I'm using the uh, actual values here. And this is where the control output is applied. Then I have to calculate the change in control output because this is uh, Runge Kaida, you calculate changes in the state. So the, uh, and then th this is the trick. I'm calculating error. You would call that maybe Y in a, in a state machine, but basically what I'm doing is I'm taking the actual position, I'm adding random noise, and, and it's got that 0.02, um, you know, it's basically two microns with a standard deviation of one. I'm also truncating it to the 0.01 uh, millimeters and I'm subtracting my estimated value. So this is my, um, actually, you could call it, I would call this my actual position, but after I get through do doing all this, I would call it a measured position because this is what you're actually measuring. And you can see that this is far from perfect. Anyway, I'm subtracting the estimated uh, position from up above, and uh, I calculate out an error. Now what I need to do is update my uh, output. And like I said, the uh, Runge Kata returns changes in the state. So the velocity is the rate of change in position. The acceleration is the rate of change in velocity. The um, jerk is the rate of change in acceleration. And uh, this is the actual values. And then these are my estimated values. But notice that I'm using my uh, observer gains, and I'm multiplying the error by the observer gains to modify my estimated values. 
uh, my rate of change in estimated values. And now, and then the control output just gets transferred. The change in the control output from here just gets transferred over. So after I use my Runga Kata, and I'm just using Runga Kata fix because that's good enough for these kind of applications. And what I get is a, um, a table. Uh, this is milliseconds or time periods here. I have my time, actual position, actual velocity, actual acceleration. Then my estimated position, estimated velocity, estimated ex uh, acceleration, and the control output. Now, the control output is really pretty small. And the reason why is because if my feed forwards are accurate, the uh, control should only need to output maybe one or two percent, which is basically what you're seeing here. This is uh, percent output. So if I go up and down, you can see, oh, it's getting up to about seven percent. So that's probably because my error between the model and actual is um, fairly large. So now I'm going to scroll down a bit. This is mostly calculations, calculating the, uh, the jerk and the estimated jerk and the control output. And let's see how, what the results look like. And you can see here's the target position, actual position, and control output. And you can see that they're tracking fairly well, even though there's a fairly big uh, error in the estimation between the, uh, uh, the actual system and my uh, estimated position from the system identification. And what you can see is that my mean squared error in millimeters is 0.4. Now, what I can do is um, a control F9, and that recalculates. And you can see that um, the estimated error, the mean squared errors, went down in this case. You can see this is my estimated uh, natural frequency, my estimated damping factor, and my estimated gain. And this is the actual. Uh, gain, damping factor, and natural frequency. Now I can change my update rate in periods, uh, in, in seconds. So this is where I can set my parameters, and uh, you can see the velocity. And this is my error between my estimated and actual. And you can see that my resolution is 0 0.01, and you can see that most of the time my estimations are much closer to the actual than the measured value, which I get back, um, you know, that uh, after I truncate, truncate and add uh, noise error to it. So you can see that my estimations are really pretty good. Now, here is my error between the target and estimated velocity, or actual and estimated velocity. And remember that uh, resolution in this case is 10 millimeters per second. And you can see that my errors between the estimated and actual is much less. And this is much better than what I would get from just taking two positions and then dividing by the time. Here you can see the error between the actual and estimated uh, accelerations. And uh, you have to remember that the minimum resolution on the acceleration was 10 meters or uh, per second squared, or 10,000. And you can see uh, the actual only went to 3.375 or something like that, or the target went to 3.375 uh, 3 meters per second right here. You can see that my estimated is much better than uh, what I would get if I was just using the difference between uh, two measured positions. And I do the same thing for jerk. Now, let's see what a big difference it makes. I'm going to do the same, uh, use the same parameters, but I'm going to use a, um, a difference method for the PID control. I'm going to show you, uh, without the observer, how poor the control is. So this is my continuous time uh, in my state space arrays right here. And uh, this is doing the same thing as a MATLAB EXPM equation. And here I am calculating the same uh, PID and second derivative gains uh, that I used up above in the observer for to calculate the, um, well, it's basically a, a, an array 
of uh, coefficients for using in a difference equation. So this calculates my last four positions, and you can see I'm truncating it, and I'm adding the random noise, and I'm, uh, well, I'm truncating it to the resolution after I add the random noise. And uh, this is calculating the gains, or the, the control output. This is updating the state, this is returning the error history, and this is returning the control output. And this is what it looks like. This is unusable. Here you can see the velocity, the target and actual position, and the target and actual velocity. You can see the mean squared error is 37 millimeters. Uh, so um, you might think, well, I'm making this look bad. Well, yes, I am making it look bad because I'm using uh, real measured values here. But if I disable these or enable these functions so the resolution is infinite and there's no noise, you can see the control is actually pretty near perfect, even though my target, um, my estimated uh, model from which I calculated the feed forwards and the gains is not exact as the, um, the actual. You can see the control is really pretty good. But the problem with many PID systems, and especially if you're using the derivative and the second derivative gain, is that you can't estimate the velocity and acceleration accurately. And the reason why it's important is that you have to take the difference between the target and actual velocity and multiply it by the derivative gain. And you have to take the difference between the target and actual acceleration and multiply that by the second derivative gain to um, calculate a valid control output in, for a complicated model as a uh, hydraulic actuator. If you're doing a motor system, you can usually get by with just the first derivative gain. So it's not quite as uh, necessary to use the ob observers. So I'm going to disable these again. And just show you what it looks like. And you can see that the uh, uh, output is quantized. It goes in steps. And it's basically that 58% uh, percent per count that you're seeing up with, uh, calculated up above that's being superimposed upon some average output. And that's uh, when you saturate here, you can see that it's not uh, uh, doing a very good job of uh, the actual following the target positions. So let's go back up and uh, go back to my estimated model. And the noise would be, or the uh, truncation errors, would be even worse if I made this faster. So I've now changed my updates to, well, it's kind of unrealistic. Most motion controllers don't go that fast. Let's make this um, 250 microseconds. That's realistic. OK, so I've got 250 microseconds from, from my control output. Let's go back up above. And you can see that my resolution is still uh, 0.01 millimeters. Uh, but now my velocity resolution is 40 millimeters per second. And my acceleration resolution is 160 meters per second squared, which is, you know, that's 16 Gs. That's not usable. And you can see that the uh, just one count is going to cause an output of 800 and almost 870 percent. So. You know, that's just totally unusable. Yet, after using observer control, you can see that it controls quite nicely. So one of the, the takeaways you should get from this is that when you, if you're trying to close the loop quickly, you may need to use an observer. If you're trying to use a derivative and second deri uh, derivative gain, you may need to use an observer. Otherwise, what you end up with is a lot of quantizing errors and uh, output, what, what most people call output noise, but it's really quantizing error for the most part.
you see that's uh, quite nice here. My estimated positions are uh, very good. That's Remember, this is 0 0.01 here for my estimated positions. This was 40, and you can see I'm within 2. This was 40 meters, or you know, 40,000, and you can see that I'm very accurate here. So, in conclusion, Learning how to use an observer uh, can be a lifesaver. There are going to be some applications you just can't do without one, without being able to estimate states. Another thing that's um, kind of related is uh, Kalman filters. I'll get to that on another video. But basically, the Kalman filters uh, do the same thing, only the filters are uh, gains are calculated to minimize the error between the target and actual, um, or the, yeah, the estimated and actual errors are trying to be minimized. But above all, the key is having a good model to start with, and that's why system identification is critical.